It is difficult to imagine modern life without plastics. Plastics are everywhere, from food to water, and even in our bodies. It is estimated that about 8 to 10 million tons of plastic waste enters our oceans every single year. This has caused devastating impacts for multiple marine species. We have seen images and videos of many animals being choked or entangled in plastics. Furthermore, this plastic waste breaks down into tiny pieces of plastic called microplastics, which are smaller than 5 millimeters. Microplastics are so pervasive that they've been found in the deepest part of the ocean, the Mariana Trench. Furthermore, zooplankton, which are the base of the marine food chain, have been captured consuming microplastics. And microplastics have even been found in the human placenta and our digestive systems. This issue is extremely serious and action must be taken now. Hi, my name is Ankur Shah and welcome to my YouTube channel. I make videos on environmental and cultural issues with a focus on how we can leave the world better than we found it. Now globally, about 9 billion tons of plastics have been produced since 1950. Out of that 9 billion tons, almost 79% has been accumulated in landfills or the natural environment with the rest being recycled or incinerated. The global rate of plastic production has exponentially increased and now is over 350 million tons per year. Now, this rate is expected to increase if business as usual continues. 99% of plastics comes from fossil fuels. Basically, plastic is kind of a plan B for fossil fuels if we actually successfully transition our energy sector to 100% renewable energy. Let's start by just going over how plastic is made. So plastic is made of polymers, which is a bunch of molecules put together in a very tough chain, which is one of the reasons why plastic is so appealing because it's basically indestructible, which is also one of its biggest downfalls because it means that it can't be broken down for hundreds, if not thousands of years. When it comes to plastic consumption per capita or per person, countries such as the US, Germany, Norway, even Guyana lead the way. But when it comes to plastic pollution, countries in Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan and Northern Africa are leading because developing countries lack the waste management infrastructure needed to keep plastic pollution in control. Now, only 20 rivers are responsible for nearly 70% of ocean plastic pollution. Here's a case in point. I grew up in the densely populated city of Mumbai in India. Here's a polluted river near the place I lived. It is filled with sewage and plastic waste because of lack of waste management infrastructure. These sites are very common in many developing countries around the world. Now, as this river shows, most of this plastic waste initially ends up near coasts due to river discharges into the oceans. Over a few years, this plastic waste collects in circular ocean currents called gyres, the most well-known of which is called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is larger than the state of Texas. This pollution is not visible to the naked eye for the most part, but let's come back to coasts. It is difficult for governments or organizations to keep a check on the locations of coastal plastic pollution, and we definitely need to move away from using single-use plastics for convenience. But what if there was an efficient way to monitor the locations of marine pollution and track this plastic across the globe for aiding ocean cleanup efforts? Say hello to satellites. Satellites can be compared to eyes looking at the Earth from space. They can actively or passively look at the Earth using different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. Satellites have been used in various environmental applications such as monitoring air quality, water quality, even deforestation, species distribution, and wildfires, among many other applications. Remote sensing is the technical term for the acquisition of information about an object or phenomenon without making physical contact with it. The remote sensing of marine plastics and marine pollution is relatively new with most of the research dating back to only 2016. The initial research on marine plastic detection using satellites has been spearheaded by scientists from the Ocean Cleanup, University of the Aegean, the Plymouth Marine Laboratory, European Space Agency, and the University of Hawaii, with a few other institutions. Most of the plastic detection work so far has used Sentinel-2, which are two polar satellites of the European Space Agency. The Sentinel-2 satellite has 13 different bands which are wavelength ranges that are used for specific applications. 
The research has used specific bands or wavelength ranges of a 10 meter spatial resolution, which simply means that each square pixel of the band image is 10 meters by 10 meters. Plastic pollution in certain locations has been successfully detected with the combinations of specific wavelengths called spectral indices. Two such indices developed by researchers include the plastics index and the floating debris index, which has been used to isolate plastics floating on the ocean surface. Researchers have also used drones and planes with sensors to detect ocean plastics. All of the links to the relevant research articles are in the description below, so please check them out. One promising research opportunity was to detect marine plastics using small satellite imagery with a higher spatial resolution and combine artificial intelligence techniques to create automatic detection models. So Lily Thomas from Development Seed and myself from NASA Impact collaborated to pursue this opportunity. We selected the PlanetScope satellite from Planet's constellation of satellites. It has a spatial resolution of about 3 meters and this is quite optimal for observing finer object shapes such as that of marine debris. Another advantage of planet data is that it has a shorter revisit time than Sentinel-2, meaning that there can be more cloud-free images of places obtained with planet scope data. Now one major drawback is that the planet scope satellite has only four bands or wavelength ranges which are red, green, blue, and near infrared. The previously mentioned floating debris indices require a short wave infrared or SWIR band. Since this band is not available in planet scope imagery, we were unable to isolate plastics themselves, but we could successfully detect floating marine debris aggregates, which contain the mixture of plastics, seaweed, wood, algae, and sea foam. Our project was able to create an AI-based detection model for coastal floating marine debris. The first step is to create an extensive dataset of the detection target to train and test the model. In our case, the target will be marine debris aggregates. So we began this project with a literature review and a collection of validated marine debris locations for finding the right imagery for training our model. Several research papers had the exact coordinates of locations, but the majority of our training dataset came from this paper on detecting marine debris near the Bay Islands of Honduras. This study had locations of validated marine plastics with boating expeditions conducted after river discharge events. We co-located this data on Planet Explorer, which is the official planet imagery exploration tool. After finding all of the planet scope images or scenes which contained validated marine debris, we had to draw bounding boxes covering each marine debris aggregate. We used an amazing tool called Image Labeler developed by NASA Impact to achieve this. We created a total of 1,370 bounding boxes of marine debris and created tiled images for our dataset. In the end, we had square JPEG images of 256 by 256 pixels for training and testing our marine debris detection model. Lily Thomas will now explain how our model was created as she led its development. For this project, we developed a model that detects objects and images using neural networks, which are algorithms modeled after the human brain. In our case, the objects are marine debris aggregates and the images are pictures of the ocean taken from satellites. Algorithms based on neural networks are collectively associated with a branch of machine learning called deep learning, which is known to be uniquely powerful when decoding complex data and interpreting abstract relationships. Such as what differentiates a marine debris aggregate from a similarly shaped and or colored wake or cloud. Object detection is the class of deep learning algorithms that we've implemented. The model learns in a supervised manner with information contained in a training data set. The data used for training is separate from the data used for testing, which is important when assessing the performance of a trained model, as this partitioning enables us to determine whether the algorithm has indeed learned a generalizable pattern, or rather just memorized the information associated with the training data. As for the makeup of the data, the training and testing data sets include image tiles, arrays of coordinates describing rectangular polygons encompassing objects, and the classes of the objects. Object detection algorithms generally entail subjecting an, an input image to a feature extraction network, followed by a scan of the learned features representative of possible objects, application of a regressor to maximize localization to the objects, 
of filtering for top object candidates using a technique called non-maximum suppression, and finally, a classification of the candidates into object categories. The output of an object detection model is, for any input image, arrays of coordinates for rectangular polygons encompassing detected objects, the classes of the detected objects, as well as the confidence scores of the predictions associated with the detected objects. Our model was written and implemented in the TensorFlow framework, which was developed and made available by Google. To assess the model's performance after training, we compute evaluation metrics using formulas standard for object detection. Confusion matrices, which tell us the number of true positives, false positives, true negatives, and false negatives present in our test dataset predictions. Intersection over union, which gives us a measure of the model's spatial accuracy. Precision, which tells us how many positive predictions were correct. Recall, which tells us how many real positive examples were predicted correctly and the F1 score, which is the harmonic mean of precision and recall. Therefore, our initial detection model had an F1 score of 0.74, and it operated only on RGB, or optical imagery. Our model primarily learned physical attributes of marine debris, such as the color and shape of it. And this is how it detected marine debris. For our future work, the first thing we want to do is decompose marine debris aggregate detections into their constituent materials. We want to use specific wavelengths for detecting floating plastics in the marine debris that our model can successfully detect. This will be achieved by co-locating our planet dataset with a satellite such as Sentinel-2 which has many more wavelengths we can use for detecting plastics. We also plan to increase the geographical diversity of our training dataset for our object detection model and make it scalable to global detections with a high accuracy. We will also collaborate with a group of researchers around the world who are focused on this problem of detecting plastics with satellites. Ultimately, the goal is to create high frequency detections for hotspot locations of marine plastics to aid ocean cleanup and policy efforts, especially by governments and organizations like the Ocean Cleanup. Now, technological solutions such as satellites and AI for detecting ocean plastic pollution is not going to solve the problem because it is just detecting and not solving the root cause. We need to reduce and eliminate single-use plastics from our economy. We need to tell companies and manufacturers to reduce single-use packaging, which accounts for about half of all plastics produced. Organizations such as the Plastic Pollution Coalition, the Story of Stuff, and the New Plastics Economy, among many others, are doing this work, so check them out. Links are in the description below. You can email your senators and local businesses using these organization websites to reduce single-use plastics in our economies. We need to move away from a take, make, and waste economy to a circular economy that recycles, repurposes, and reuses materials. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation is doing some amazing work on this, so please do check them out. I do want to quickly mention that there are a lot of alternatives to plastics that people are coming up with, whether or not it's in the form of bioplastics, though then I have to get into the whole conversation of industrial composting versus regular composting because they're not the same thing. So when you see something that says compostable, it's probably industrially compostable, which means that you can put it into a compost and it would decompose. That's not how it works. And there's also a difference between biodegradable and compostable. There's a lot to talk about, <laughs> but basically there are other plastics that are more naturally made that are coming onto the market. The problem is, is that they're just not as economically feasible right now. And then there's also um, different forms of tough material that could be used in replace of plastic, such as hemp. So there are interesting things that are coming online. It's kind of like we have multiple things to look at here. We have the where the plastic goes that is used, how to reduce our own plastic input using um, longer term items, and what are some alternatives for short term plastic items. Because we're not going to completely get rid of uh, using short term items, especially in places like the medical industry where it just is helpful in the in the way of sanitary needs. So there's many different elements to talk about in regards to that.
My main suggestion though is if you see legislation like the type that's currently coming out of California to ban plastic items or to increase clarity in what is recyclable and what is not, definitely make sure that you vote on that. In your own personal life, find ways to reduce your plastic use. Recycle is no longer the most important term in the three R's, now reduce and reuse. Those are the really most important items. Reduce the amount of plastic production that comes your way and reuse as much as you can. Though maybe don't reuse like water bottle, like the, you know, the single use ones because as we talked about microplastics in the body, don't reuse things that weren't really meant to be reused, I guess. I don't know, it gets a little complicated, but try to reduce the amount of plastic that you can. To some extent, it is honestly kind of a, um, a privileged thing to be able to reduce the amount of plastics you use, but in many cases, you know, bringing your own water bottle instead of using a ton of plastic water bottles is a really good start. So that was Becky Hogue from The Becky Sphere. She's a climate YouTuber with her channel focusing on climate journalism and climate change solutions. Please do check it out. The link to her channel is in the card on the top right corner. She has also published an amazing video relating plastics to climate change. So check it out in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't below, especially if you found this valuable. And please share this video on social media or share it with your friends to spread the word. Please do comment your thoughts on how you reduce plastic pollution and the solutions you see to this crisis.